Well, hello and welcome to PM Express and Eid Mubarak to us all. What a peaceful country we live in. Country that has so much religious tolerance. It's unbelievable. I mean, I uh, think as far as civility goes in this aspect, I don't know if there's another country that beats us on this where there's so much religious tolerance whether it's christians or islam traditionalists we all cohabit peacefully and today is one such day where the islam muslims have their big day you know eid or adha where they will slaughter a ram or a cow and share with anyone you know who's within close proximity of this meat and funny enough we Christians actually look forward more to this feast than they themselves do. And I think it's a beautiful thing. But it's all about sacrifice. And so today, you know, as I was pondering, I was just wondering, I mean, look at such a beautiful thing, where individuals will go out with their own hard-earned money, buy a ram, buy a cow, kill it, and make sure that all those in the neighborhood, you know, who otherwise wouldn't have been able to enjoy such meat would have to come and enjoy. What a beautiful activity. Even though today Christians are not on the table for discussion, it's the same. You look at these two religions and their motive or the underlining, the foundation is all about love, sacrifice, you know, caring for a neighbor. And that's what the religion says. And you and I are those who practice the religion and we make probably about 97% of the population, you know, either Muslim or uh, Christian. But when you sit back and you look at the nation and you look at how it's going and you ask yourself, well, where are the Muslims and where are the Christians who are supposed to be sacrificial, humble, sharing and caring? So have we made religion a, an event where today becomes an event? You kill a cow, you know, give one person to eat, but tomorrow you're on his neck, say, hey, you know, that was yesterday, today is today. Is that what's happening? But obviously today is not Christianity matter. So today we're asking our Muslim brothers that indeed if sacrifice and it's such a big day based on sacrifice, and I think it's very admirable to have literally a festival of sacrifice, care for your brother. But then look at Ghana. Do we see that sacrifice from leadership all the way coming? So today I'm going to ask my Muslim brother if indeed this sacrificial thing is just an event or it should be a way of life. My name is Anand Sakwa the fourth, Chief of the Little Republic of Akwamu Edumasa. When I come back, we're having a beautiful conversation. Don't go. Well, thank you very much for staying and uh, I have in the studio my good brother, Sheikh Mohammed Bagaya. As far as uh, modernity and uh, <laughs> contemporaryness is concerned with Islam, I don't think there's, we can write a book and leave you out. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Nana. Bring in an Asian book, an Asian religion, <laughs> and make it applicable and relevant yes. in 2018. I think you have been a, a, a good crusader. Thank you very much. Anna. And I'm sure Thank Allah so will be very proud of you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm humbled. So, Eid Mubarak, my brother. Eid Mubarak, my brother. How are you? Very well, Mashallah. very well, very well. But for, for those who, you know, people say, ah, which one is this one? Is this the big one? Is this the mm. small one? You know, what this happened? This is the big one. This is the big and one. And the Eid al-Abha is a is a big is a big one, and the Eid al-Fitr is a small is a small Eid. Okay, mm. but th th there wasn't a fast for this one. No, there wasn't a fast. This um, comes with the Hajj pilgrimage, and oh. the other one comes after the fasting. Okay, uh -huh. okay. Yeah. So so uh, this is, I don't, I don't, but people are already at the Hajj. Yes, and they'll be back home in about. Maybe the next week or so. The so they'll, is they'll, almost they'll about celebrate theirs there? Exactly. Exactly. It, we do it in tandem with what is happening uh, in Mecca. Yesterday, for instance, it, Muslims were on the mountain of Arafah, which is the pinnacle of the Hajj itself. And so from Arafah, they would then have to come to Muzdalifa, go to Mina, go and do the stoning of the devil, come and shave their hair, and then get ready to pack their bags and come back home. So today actually is a, is a day of sacrifice. From, from the mountain you come down and then you perform your, 
your sacrifice, um, um, commemorating what Abraham did so many years ago. Now, when we say sacrifice, mm. I mean, sacrifice is very relative. Is sacrifice just saying, okay, I kill the chicken, come and take the wing? Mm. I mean, now you're putting me in gear. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sacrifice is um, sacrifice is to give something that you truly love yourself. Is 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 to give something that you would love to have in order to achieve an end that is bigger and greater than your own self. That is what sacrifice is. Yeah. So you realize that what Muslims are involved in today, and we keep repeating it each year that we find ourselves alive, is to, is to go through a ritual that is supposed to remind us of something so very important, so very significant in our lives, not just as Muslims, but as human beings as well. And it's also an opportunity that God avails for us to keep making ourselves whole again each time. That is how much love God has, has for, for the human family. You would realize that in the scriptures, in the Muslim scripture, it says that none comes unto God except as a humble servant. Let me put it that way. And for you to achieve that, you need to live an exemplary life that has been, that was once upon a time lived by the likes of Abraham, Jesus, Muhammad, uh, and, and the rest of them. What does this truly mean? You realize that again the scripture mentions severally that Allah God is a jealous God. Allah God is a jealous God. Sometimes it is difficult to understand because jealousy is an emotion that speaks to a lesser being. So then how does God become a jealous God? Mm -hmm. But as you descend deep with some wisdom into the scriptures you begin to understand all the provisions, all what you enjoy in your life, your health, your, your, your life, your looks, your wealth, and everything were given to you by God. So how then would you want to give his grace, his thanks, his glory to somebody else? Human beings may be conduits of God's mercies and, and favors, but ultimately all these gratitude and thanks and has to go back to God. And so when you study the scripture carefully, you realize that, yes, God has every right to be jealous because he provides for everything. That's why he says, know that I, God, your Lord, am the only one you're supposed to worship. Don't have any other God but me. Because he provides for you. You eat of fruits and plants that obey divine law to grow. And then in the end, you want to rebel against the same laws that keeps you alive. Wow. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that it is one thing to claim to love God. The first step when you say, I love God, is just the first step. But you would know, you would truly know whether you love God after he tests you. That is why he had to test Adam in the Garden of Eden. He says you could eat of any tree that you so desire except this one. And that was the test. And Adam somehow failed the test. Mm -hmm. Abraham, in this case, is a friend of God. God refers to him as a friend. Now, when, a God when God chooses a servant, he wants to truly understand, does this man truly love me the way he claims mm -hmm. he loves me? So even Abraham ought to be tested. You know, you realize that his wife Sarah had been barren for so many years. Up until he had something to do with Hagar, he never had a child. Mm -hmm. And the boy... As a 13, 12 or 13, some scriptures say, then God says, this is the test. Take this boy up the mountain and sacrifice the only child that you love so much. Sacrifice him for me. Now, this is what God wants to realize. How do you truly show your love to God? You have to prove it to God. We all go to church, we go and pray in the mosque, in our claim of our love to God. But how do you prove it? So in the end, he will test you. But he will test you with the very things that you love so much, you know, that he would want you to sacrifice it and show that you truly love God. Muslims who are watching this program, 
we always say the biggest sin is to associate partnership with God in worship. And we think associating partnership with God is to have an object that you worship, a physical object that you worship apart from God. Wrong. Each time you choose to obey your desires, obey your lower self, so to speak, at the expense of obeisance to God, that is association partner, associating partnership with God in worship. Because it is a form of obeisance. But at this point, you fail to obey what God says, do or do not do, and you went after your own desires and your own whatever. And so as we, as we commemorate that which Abraham did so many years ago, this is what God wants us to understand, the, the significance of sacrifice in order for us to prove that we truly love him. So whether you're a politician, you're a businessman, you're whatever, whatever, that test is there. And at, at, at each time, and I was saying it before we got here, at each time, I know you've been propositioned before so many times in your life that you have to make choice between what your religion says you should do and what your desires are telling you to do. And each time you choose to pursue your desire at the cost of God's instructions, then you are doing something contrary. You are not showing love to God as he ultimately wants you to show. Uh, let me, uh, you know, like, like ask <coughs> unfair questions. Let me ask an unfair question. Mm. I mean, but uh, wouldn't God know that, yes, this guy is faithful and if I ask him to go and kill his son, mm. he will do it? Because he's all-knowing. Mm. So that, that, you know, that's where we get confused. Look, mm. the guy is all-knowing. So mm. he knows that Abraham will take Isaac to the slaughter if I ask him to mm. do it. Mm. Why, why, why would he go for it? See, God always speaks to us in a language that we understand. Mm. If you take the, the Quran, for instance, and you want to listen to the voice of God himself, it then becomes a difficult thing for you to get it. But you have to listen to that language that he, use, he uses to speak with you through the, uh, the Quran that you may understand. So he deals with, that, with us at the level where we understand it best. You know, you're a human being. And that is how God would deal with you as a human being. He wouldn't deal with you as God. And that is why each time, let me go back a little bit, each time we, 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 we engage God in all things, the ultimate understanding there for us should be the law. The law. Not God. The law. You ought to consider sometimes the law as God himself. You know, because the first thing that he created was not human being, was not water, was law. So for water to come into existence, there ought to be a law that water would follow to come into existence. And then he created order. So from law and order, you get everything right. Once we have a proper understanding of what law is, it doesn't matter what it is, man-made laws. Law is law. But in this case, the divine laws were set in position. That is why when the, the Quran says, each time he says, be, something comes into existence. But this coming into existence sometimes could take time, not just as he says, be. So for instance, Nana came into existence, but through time and space. And that is how it works for us as human beings. Mm. Mm. So as, as, as a Muslim, mm. what, what is the significance of today? I mm. mean, uh, is, is, is it a, 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 a way of life mm. or is it an event for today? It is supposed to be a way of life. It is supposed to be the moment where we grow above the ritual. It is supposed to be a day when it is, we, 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 are, we have a transcendental understanding of our spiritual journey towards God. So that next year when we come to perform the same ritual again, we are going through it, but at a much higher level. It is sick and sad that you find Muslims, even Christians, and Jewish people caught up within the rituals of worship, and they think that is it. You know, meanwhile, these rituals in themselves, by themselves, are not the truth. They're supposed to be the embodiments of bigger truth that we are supposed to reach. So in physics, they say the higher it goes, the cooler and cleaner it becomes, just like the dust particles. That is how you rise and you grow in God. But as you go higher in spirit, you're supposed to become cleaner 
and, and purer. And that is what God expects of us as we perform this rituals. Today, we're supposed to go up a little higher. Next year, you are going up a little higher so you become purer and cooler and be able to reflect the divine. Once you reflect the divine, everything is okay, like they say in New York. <laughs> <laughs> Let's come back to the uh, the cosmetics of it. So, mm. uh, what what should be done today? You you slaughter you know an, an animal. Yes, it is it is um, not so much of a big deal the slaughtering of the of, of the animal. I, I like to say it again. It's not so much of a big deal. I mean, it's it's, it's, it's symbolic for those who can afford it. But you see, once again, we are caught up into in, in it. We think even with some families, they may want to go and borrow money, you know, and, and, and then make sure that they, at least they, they can buy some ram or some cow and make sure that the sacrifice is, is performed. But that is not, the, the, the essence of the sacrifice actually has nothing to do with the animal. It is your intentions and, and, and the clarity, um, the clarity, what I'll call, of your transparent nature and spirit as you relate to God. Mm -hmm. You know, so the meat and the blood, according to the Quran, has nothing to do with God. Your intentions and how pure your heart is, is what God looks at. So today, for instance, we, we pray. The prayer is more important than the animal. <laughs> and then the animal is just for, it serves a social purpose. Mm -hmm. You kill it, and, and then you, you testify that to God. I've done my part, you know, and then may Allah accept my prayer. So now, uh, the, 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 the food itself, now you, you, you enjoy it with your family, your friends, and your neighbors, and everybody like we do beautifully in this country. Do, do you see a situation where we run the risk of uh, putting more focus on the ram mm. than the significance mm. of, the, of, the, of the larger That is event? what we're suffering today. And it has been so over the years. It's been so in so many Muslim countries. It's been so with so many practicing Muslims. The, the, the essence has been on the new clothes we wear today, on, the, on, the, on how big the animal I bought, you know, as against what you bought, you know, <laughs> is today. You know, how much money I spent today, how much food is cooked in my home today. It's all good. But I'm saying that it is better to dwell on the spirit of the sacrifice and not on, 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 on what it looks, you know, on the outside. Is, is that, I mean... I don't want to, because uh, there are no Christians here today. But, uh, is that why in the larger society, mm. uh, our faith is not reflecting in the larger society? Because, mm. you know, we, we should have been somewhere, if you dropped from mass and mm. you came down, mm. you should wow, these are Muslims or these are Christians. But mm. at the moment, I'm sure if you dropped from mass and you came, you wonder, you know, what, 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 what's happening here? Christians and Muslims. Our inability to see God through our own selves makes us relate to God hypocritically. So we think God is some mythical dude, so to speak, that hangs somewhere in heaven. If you want to have a, a, a proper relationship with God, you have to be able to bring God to your own level. At that high level, sometimes you can't reach it. You have to bring God to your own level. How much of God is there in Nana and Sakwao that I need to respect, you know, and, and relate to in that order? And that is how, you know, and that is how beautiful it becomes for you. So I can treat you right as I want to treat my own self right. If you're a Christian, you understand what Christ said as far as your love for God is concerned. God wants it all. Love God with your heart, your soul, your body, your spirit. He wants it all. That's the first law, right? Mm -hmm. And the second law. It's to love your neighbor as to love your own self. And that is how you get to God, through loving somebody else. God wouldn't, wouldn't come down from heaven by himself for you to see him. He comes down through Nana Sakwa, through Muhammad Bagheer, through anybody else that walks around uh, anywhere else in this world. And once we're able to bring God to our own level and relate to him in that order, then we get it right. And that is why for people like me and your dear wife, we've always been hammering up on the point that people should be able to see women as the blueprint of relating to God. If you love a woman so much, Nana, what wouldn't you do for a woman? You do anything for a woman you love. Sometimes she speaks and you panic. It's not because you are afraid. It's how much love you have for her. You don't want to go 
against the woman you so love. And that, in that same token, match it higher a little bit and relate to God in that token or more. And that's why, how you have you know, a better and clearer understanding of what God is. So th this hypocritical mm. relationship, which has now become the norm, mm. I'm afraid, is it because of how it's being taught to us? Or why have we adopted this hypocritical thing? Because uh, we are definitely not reflecting the, the, the religions. In Christianity, in Islam, and of course in Judaism, I believe strongly that some men and women would face the wrath of God on the day of judgment simply because they shrouded a lot more teachings, the honest teachings of these faith in secrecy in order that they can have dominance and control over humanity. And that is a sad, 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 sad situation that we happen to have found ourselves in as people of faith. Faith is a beautiful thing. Religion is very, is very beautiful. But unfortunately, human beings, some human beings have hijacked the proper understanding of what religion is. And so we, we see people use this very beautiful thing, religion, and commit crimes against humanity and against God. They could be Jewish people, Christians, or Muslims. We are all, we are all caught up in the same thing. And, and that is why we are suffering these consequences of what this world has become today. A larger portion of humanity are religious people. If you're not a Christian, you're a Muslim. If you're not a Muslim person, you're a Jewish person. Or maybe anything, any other religion that you want to, you want, you want to, you want to pursue. And how come? If it is true that we are on a journey towards God, using religion, how come this world is going so bad and so, and so, and so sick? Mm -hmm. you know, what is happening to the world if religion truly exists and is supposed to work for us as human beings? These questions we need to ask. And so, again, the issue of teaching it then arises, particularly with Islam. A portion or a section of us as Muslims at a point in history, decided to teach this religion wrong. And it was taught deliberately so as to give birth to the wrong application of what is being taught, you know. And so that the long-term effect is what we are seeing today. And it started for a long time. If, and if care is not taken, this would continue for a very long time. Except when we see wisdom in, in reteaching this religion correctly. And I say this each time I have the opportunity to say so because our history as Muslims, somewhere in the middle, became so dirty and so nasty, all in the quest for power, all in the quest for power. And people really did bad things, bad things by their own family, by their own people, in order to become rulers of, 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 of the Muslim uh, uh, entity. And, and that's a very sad thing that happened to us, and we need to make those corrections. Otherwise, we'll continue in, on, on that sad path. I'm going to take a break, and then when we come back, what can we do to make sure that the Muslim born today, the one that's under five years old, does not fall in the trap of valuing just the killing of the ram rather than giving himself out to the larger society? Don't go away. I'm coming. Well, thank you very much for staying and uh, Eid Mubarak once again and we're having a very, very deep discussion as to how come we are such a religious people but our religious culture is not seen in the collective society. And uh, just before the break, Sheikh, I wanted to find out uh, why or how mm. are we going to break this cycle that those who are you know, coming after us would not mm -hmm. value the size of the ram, but rather be more interested in sacrificing for the greater nation. It's a, it's a, we're, we're trapped in a vicious circle. <clears throat> yes. The, 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 the thoughts has to be set correctly. I mean, the, the younger generations have to grow up understanding that they're not supposed to be regional Muslims, so to speak. They're supposed to behave as universal Muslims. They think universal as a Muslim. You, the, your ability to carry, like I said on your, one of your programs, to carry the world on your shoulders as you walk 
your life is so very important. You don't have to be thinking of yourself alone as a Muslim. And that's why we say this religion is a way of life. It's not just, you know, rituals and, and, and claim to things that are big in, in, in all of this. So the next generation of younger Muslims coming up ought to think and know that the faith they are pursuing or the ideology that they believe in so much is not monolithical in nature. It, does, it can't stand on its own by itself. It, it has respect for other religions too as well. It ought to be able to accommodate other people's thoughts and beliefs as well. But above everything, respect other people's opinions and other people's religions as well. And that's how you can create a better world. The it's dangerously very missing, though. <laughs> Honestly, these things you're saying, mm. and uh, you know, probably has just, you know, mm. because what kind of trust I just said, but it's very important mm. and seriously missing mm. in the teaching. Exactly. Tolerance, acceptance of others, people's opinions. Mm. Uh, you see, when, when Islam, when, when, when the Prophet started teaching Islam, emphasis was on sincerity sincerity instead of the emphasis on islam as a religion you know you ought to be able to be a sincere and honest person in order for you to have an excellent relationship with god you have to be clear in all things that you do otherwise you will fail along the line and to be honest truly and sincere is how you relate to the to your, to your own family to the, to the persons you see around you how can you demonstrate honesty to yourself alone. You demonstrate it by exhibiting certain things that somebody else will find it within you. So this value exists within you. And that's how you become to discover that yourself, you're an honest person, you're a sincere person. And once you, 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 you start from that point, then relating to God, and, and in this case, you begin to know God by knowing how he reflects in all bodies. And, and that's so very important in the teaching of religion. So the next generation of Muslims have to have this set of understandings. I am, it is not just me in this world. There are other people too in this world who are practicing what they believe into as well. I've always said that, that the ways that connect an individual to God outnumber the human breath. If you think you are a Muslim and so you are the, you are the best of mankind, you are making a mistake. Somebody else is a Christian and to him, he's the best who knows God more than anybody else. If you, are, if you call me a kafir, a kafir simple means a non-believer. If you call somebody a kafir because he doesn't believe in what you believe in, to him you are also a kafir because you don't believe in what he believes in. Mm -hmm. So you ought to have respect for other people's faith and, and, and see them and value what they value. You know, value that which they value. You may not believe in it, you know, but you have to have respect for what they do because these are not a set of, so to speak, idiots. They are a sense of Sensible people doing things that they think it is right. So these things will help the next generation to understand, you know, the world in a, in a much broader way. <coughs> Mustafa Hamid mm. says that the man who goes before his God mm. and takes off his hat mm. is no more than the man who goes before his God mm. and puts on his hat. Exactly. For they are doing it for the same reasons. Exactly. You know. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're doing it for the same exactly. reasons. Exactly. Mm. Are these teachings going down though? Well, we, I, see, I see a cadre of younger men and women coming up who are more broader mm -hmm. in their thinking and more, you know, and more accommodating than some of us would ever be. Mm -hmm. you know, these are people who are integrating into societies that are now, um, let me say, uh, now, uh, um, I'm looking for the right word. But society has become more involving than it, is, than it was in the past. Maybe with the help of social media and things like that, we've become so close to each other than we were in the past. I would say yes, it is working, but it is gradual. The other side is that the evil that had been seen in the Muslim world associated to us as in you know, terrorism and stuff like that, is being knocked off gradually. It, it is, the whole idea is beginning to fail now. So the younger ones going up are beginning to realize that mm -mm, this is not the right way to go. And as a matter of fact, there's a better way that we, we can go. So I say, yes, it is working. And I believe that it would work. But 
it, it needs some push. And those of us who are in the position to do so should be able to provide some sense of direction where these younger men can, can also follow. In, in, in spite of our imperfections in all religions, mm. you know, being hypocritical with God and everything, mm. we have, you know, an, uh, some level of religious tolerance mm. that I think is very it's envious. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know where we get it from, but mm. we, we, we have a good religious tolerance mm. in this country. It is so very beautiful. It's indeed an example that so many countries would love to emulate. Our life in this country is, is so beautiful. Yes, we have our own challenges as Ghanaians, as, as, as people of faith. We've got a small, small issues, but so far, I think if I, if I look around, you know, on the entire continent of Africa, I would say Ghana is, is the best country where you see. I've seen, you know, Kenya, you know, they're doing well. I've also, I know of, um, is it Tanzania, where okay. they're also doing very well. But I think Ghana, we stand out. I mean, it's about the best, and everybody keeps talking about it. But this is a treasure mm -hmm. that we need to consolidate and make sure that we sustain it and make it better. You know, I, I, I don't, maybe by our, our nature, the way we are as Ghanaians, I mean, we are level headed people. We don't like trouble, <laughs> you know, we, we talk too much. <laughs> but we don't like trouble. But I, I think this is a very, 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 very big treasure that all Ghanaians have to keep working on it. So we we'll see. Look at how we can we can we can preserve it. I, I raised it because are we living it by chance or is it something that let's say maybe the chief imam, mm. the Presbyterian moderator, maybe the Catholic bishop, mm. at that level, uh, are they you know making extra effort so that we see them eating together or something for us to continue? Are we working on it or we've just left it by chance? I, I think it's a combination of both. You know, it's our nature and then the, the kind of energy we put into it. Yeah. I know of the National Chief Imam's efforts in this direction. Early on, I was speaking somewhere and I said, if you want an example of a, of a good Muslim, look at the National Chief Imam. Yeah. A man who has time for everybody. He has time for the rich, for the poor, for the old, for the young. Even 13, 14-year-olds organize events and they invite him. He comes and sits there and blesses it. He has time for everybody. He has love for everybody. He doesn't have hatred for anybody. Recently, when he celebrated his birthday, pastors, Christian pastors, showed up, you know, and joined him to celebrate his birthday. What is more beautiful than this? I mean, this is a man who is more of a unifier. He tries to unify everybody and make the nation look so, so great and, and, and peaceful. So this is an example of a man that every Muslim would want to Emulate. Sometimes you may want to hate him for some reason, but the moment you set eyes on the old man, you simply fall in love with him. It's, 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 it's natural. That, that, that magnet, that divine magnet is there, mm -hmm. and then it will just pull you by nature. And so I, 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 I think that most Muslims, most Muslims we want to be like the National Chief mm -hmm. Imam is today. And I, I, I also see certain efforts uh, I know of, I know I can, I know of what certain pastors are doing in this country. I have, I have pastor friends in this country with whom I, I, I rule very nicely, mm -hmm. the likes of Pastor Bernard Adeakwa of the Powerhouse Ministry. I, sometimes I join him do the crossover every 31st <laughs> December, <laughs> which nice. is very beautiful. I mean, spiritual or religious solidarity is something that we should tolerate. It doesn't mean that I'm a Christian. I'm a Muslim who is in love with what my brother does, and I respect it, and I just go there to show love and respect for for, for what he's doing. And so people are working underground to make sure that things are working. Mustafa Hamid is one such beautiful man, beautiful man who has written vast and wide on the relationship between Christianity and Islam in this country. And some of his works are being studied by so many students in, on the African continent, not just in Ghana. Okay. So he's, I mean, people are doing a great job in this country to make sure that we live peacefully and in harmony. I mean, is there ever going to? Well, I mean, it's a naive <laughs> question, but is there ever going to be that time when, uh, somebody goes into have a ministerial position and mm. go, ah, that's a Muslim, mm. uh, not just because he went to mosque on Friday or how he was dressed, mm. but because of how he behaved. Mm. I mean, are we going to get there? It's something that we expect to see, and uh, um, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm disappointed in in in. Um, 
in all the Muslims that we have in, in politics today. Indeed, I'm, I, am, I am glad to see some of them exhibits, you know, by traits the little way. Traits of humility, traits of love, exactly. traits of sacrifice. The little so that they can, you know. They, it is difficult. It is a difficult thing to do. But we hope and pray that such a day would come when you see a politician, either a minister of state or anything that would exhibit the manifestations of the teachings of Islam. You see it in his work. I know some who are such. I don't want to mention names, but I know some who are such. But we want to see more of those. It is, it is, it is something that it is something that we have to see. Because once you claim you are a Muslim, you see, some, and that's why sometimes people would, would say that politics is, Islam is not comfortable with politics. I don't know what that means. Maybe they don't know, they don't understand that there is a huge part of Islam that is politics too as well. Maybe they don't get it. But maybe they, 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 want, they mean by that that our democratic whatever, politics that we practice in this country, you know, that may not sit well with the teachings of Islam. Maybe that's what they mean by that. But in any case, it depends on the individual. It depends on the individual and how you think you can conduct yourself in office and exhibit to Ghanaians that this is a life that every Muslim politician must live. You don't have to be corrupt. You don't have to, to, to be a liar to be a successful politician. You don't have to be somebody who deceives people to be successful in politics. As a matter of fact, we want to see a new day where politicians will be able to speak the truth for what it truly means and let people vote for him for speaking the truth. We have a nation that we, we want to see laws work mm -hmm. instead of laws remaining inks on papers. We want to see the day when Christians and Muslim politicians would, would make these laws rise up and work so that this nation can, can, can become better. We're coming straight back. Don't go away. Well, the final one before I close is a big one, <laughs> and that's to the Sheikh. You've always asked big questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sheikh, <clears throat> I don't know if it happens now, but, mm. you know, in the past, I realized that uh, Muslim or Islam always preach to the converted. Mm. And so those non-Muslims are cut out. So assuming somebody did a cartoon, you know, of a, you know, of a Muslim, and it was offensive. I, I realized that like, instead of coming out and educating us, that mm. look, maybe according to chapter two or chapter three, this is forbidden. Mm. You know, they come with so much aggression mm. and everything. And so those of us non-Muslims mm. who don't seem to find that offensive, mm. sit back and don't know why, why, you, why you're so angry. Yeah. But maybe if you're taking time to say, no, you know, in, in our books, this mm. is a big insult to us. Oops, then that was wrong. Mm. And I, I don't know that maybe the, the older generation missed a lot of opportunity mm. in educating mm. non-Muslims to understand and appreciate that, oh, no, no, don't go there. It's not right. Mm. I don't know if I'm right. Now, here, is, here is the point. Prophet Muhammad, for instance, to us Muslims, is the best ever, the best mankind that ever walked the surface of this earth. So we hold him in a very, very extraordinary high esteem. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's next to God. Mm -hmm. Prophet Muhammad, if he, that's why before you, you can become a Muslim, you say, La ilaha illallah, which means there's no deity worthy of worship but Allah. But you ought to add that Prophet Muhammad is truly his messenger. That makes you a Muslim. Without that, you're not a Muslim. So that is how, that is who he is to us. So any attempt to denigrate or insult that prophet in any way has the potential to ignite fire in every, in every Muslim society. However, in our response to such situations, do we think that if the prophet was alive today, he would be happy with the way we respond to issues? Exactly. You know, just to say that we are protecting him. To honor him, we respond so fiercely and so, so gruesome sometimes. Is that the way he would love for us to respond? Couldn't that have become, like you said, an opportune moment to teach people to understand that this is who the prophet means to us? Yes, some people deliberately 
touch on these things to because they know that once they touch on them, Muslims would, would behave this way or that way. But I'm saying that according to the teachings of the Quran, to react, if any, any reaction has to be commensurate to the action meted out. Wow. You know, so that's the Quran says, when I cop them, if you were if you were to punish, punish commensurate. Just the way that the person pinched you, pinch him in that manner. Make sure you don't no more, no less. You know. So but he went further to say that, but if you forgive the person, it is better. Wow. You know, so ultimately, it would have been better if you do not react at all. And sometimes silence is the best response. When you keep quiet, in, in, in a situation where people think that you'll be mad and they find out that you are not mad at all about what they say, they may get tired of the entire exercise and leave it alone. Muslims, in all things that we do, we have to be able to reflect the attributes of God and then reflect the personality of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. If you take the 99 attributes from Ar Rahman, the merciful, the, 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 the whatever, the giver, the supplier, the whatever, it is 99 names. That is why the prophet, the, what the prophet wants us to, to, to understand. Live your life in the attributes of God Almighty and reflect my own personality. So if Nana, for instance, slaps me and I want to retaliate back, I need to think carefully. What would Prophet Muhammad have done in the same situation? If he would, have, if he would strike back, I would strike back. But if he wouldn't, I would never. And I know that that man would never ever strike back so why would i strike back and that's what muslims need to understand yes we have things that are done politically in this world mm -hmm. you know deliberately to cause chaos and commotion but your own response could diffuse those political tensions and make useless of, of what of what it was supposed to serve in the first place because sometimes the response seems to get more uh, news or mm. more, more airtime mm. than the action. I've always said it. it. It is easy for us as Muslims to make people into stars. <laughs> it's easy. You want to become a popular person, insult Islam today. The next day you are a big guy. You walk with all the big security people following you. <laughs> US will give you protection. UK will give you protection. You want visa, you will get it. <laughs> You know, <laughs> you begin to enjoy life yes, tomorrow because you insulted Prophet Muhammad. It's easy. It, it happened in Sudan. A teacher went there to, she was teaching, and somehow she said something offensive. And the Sudanese people want to kill her. And the next day she became a star. She wrote some small book. Everybody is buying. Look at Salman Rushdie. What did he do? What, what, what did he write in that book at all? Satanic verses. There's nothing in the book. The man is a star. You know, he's rich off our backs. Because of the way we behave. You know, so it, is, it, is, it, is, it is not supposed to be like I understand the passion that the young men and women have for religion and the love that they have for Prophet Muhammad. But I think we should allow cooler heads to prevail sometimes. It doesn't make you a weaker Muslim at all. It, gives you, it makes you a stronger person. And then it speaks of the depth of your thinking as a Muslim. Mm. On a day like this... Uh I think you've said it, but on a day like this, you know, what, what do you have for the younger ones? You know, if eating the ram, the sacrifice, <laughs> but going forward, I think I'll leave you to you know, give a message to the younger Muslim. The world is, is sick and the world is crazy. My world is not your world, for instance. My world is different from your world. Those of you, the younger ones that are coming up today. You realize that what we want, or what Prophet Muhammad wanted to create, the world that he wanted for all of us was a world where there would be a universal sound that puts all of us together as one family. So I, I keep saying, once I have the opportunity to do so, see, there's a universal sound bringing all of us into this world. You cry as a baby, whether you're white, black, Muslim, Christian, whatever, you come cry. And then there's a universal sound exiting the world. That last sigh of breath, you take it before you die. It doesn't matter who you are. But what is the universal sound that binds us together as a human family? We want to be able collectively, as persons of faith, to strike open that atom 
of the universal sound and allow for it to emit into the universe and affect everybody positively. So that once it touches you, you can begin to relate to your brother, to your sister, and see yourself in your brother. Your brother sees himself in you, so we can begin to have a universal family that may not be the same, may not be the same, but we have serious respect for one another. Amen. I keep saying that even as Christians, when you pray in your churches, I love that prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is it that is happening in the heavens that you want it done here? Amen. On, on, on amen. 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 <laughs> amen. All too soon. That's what time will allow us. And uh, we need to get him back more often as I keep hounding him. Get him back more often so that we put Islam on the table and discuss Islam. Not only on festivals, but in any ordinary day. But I'm sure you'll learn a thing mm. or two tomorrow. Well, no, on Thursday, we'll be back to do this all over again. Thank you very much for watching. And Sheikh, thank you so much. Nana, thank and you for having me. Mubarak again. Eid Mubarak to you too. <laughs>